John, these are extraordinary and trying times for America. We have a pandemic, we have a deep economic downturn, and now we have civil unrest. Tell me how you're thinking about this moment. I'm trying to process it the way many other people are trying to process it. Um, you know, this country um, has to get to a place where um, we're living up to uh, our core values. Uh, you know, a country that um, it, it creates creates equal opportunity and, um, and uh, for for everybody in this country. Uh, and unfortunately, race and, and and hostility toward people of color, but also other underrepresented groups, um, is something that. Um, uh, we've been living with for a very long time, and it just has to change. John, people are angry. You need only look at what's happening in the streets of cities across the nation. Are you angry? What makes me angry is not only uh, the um, the hostil hostility and violence that has been um, that's been focused on uh, our black population and the uncertainty that this creates for them um, and um, uh, the fear that it creates. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm very angry about that. And I'm also angry that we, tend, we, we seem to have a growing um, level of intolerance in this country. We seem to have a growing um, level of tolerance for bad behavior in this country as it relates to underrepresented groups or as it relates to our, our, our black community. And we see it broader than just our black community, frankly. I mean, obviously that's a critical issue right now and I don't want to distract from that, but we see it as it relates to um, uh, uh, the rights and, and freedoms, for instance, in the LGBT community, as an example. We see it in a number of places and we just have to do something about it. It's time to do something about it. And, and so people in the streets, I encourage that. Um, I applaud the protests. I think it's part of how our, uh, our it's, it's part of how we do what we do in this country. What are you doing about it on a personal level? What are you doing about it on a professional level? What is TPG doing about it? Well, on a personal level, what I'm doing about it is number one is I'm um, I'm reaching out to my black friends and my black colleagues directly, um, and I want them to know how I feel about it. I want them to know I'm angry, and I want them to know that they have my support. Um, I, I, I acknowledge that I can't quite experience it in the same way. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about that, obviously, as you talk, as you, you hear different people talk about this. So I want to I want to acknowledge to them that I can't I'm not quite experiencing it, experiencing it in the in the same way. But I want them to know that I'm there for them. I'm also interested to know what you and the firm can do over the longer term. How can you affect change? What levers can you pull as the owner of companies. You're the private equity owner of portfolio companies. You exercise governance rights. You choose management teams. What can you do and what will you do? We have had an initiative to add gender diversity to the boards of all the portfolio companies that we either control or have significant influence over. And we've added 75 women in the last tw uh, 24 months to the boards of our portfolio companies. On this issue, we are also sending a message to our portfolio companies. Um, we put out a note that describes how we're thinking about this. We've now sent that to all of our portfolio companies. We're also sending that, by the way, to our LPs as well. Um, another example of how we can move the needle on this is I think you might also be aware that um, last year we um, took a minority position um, in a firm that is black owned and black run. Um, that's an investing organization called Harlem Capital. Um, they came to us. Um, we developed a relationship. Uh, we took a minority position in the firm. We've helped them fundraise now. They had a very successful firm for a first fundraise. The focus of Harlem Capital is, into, is to invest in Black-owned businesses, Black-owned companies, um, and, and women-owned and women -owned companies, by the way. Um, so trying to use our money, use our capability, use our expertise um, to um, drive capital formation where it's, where it's vitally necessary um, is another example of how we're trying to move the needle on this. Given that you've had this much success uh, broadening the gender diversity of your portfolio company boards, will you do the same for racial diversity? Will you insist uh, that over time you affect 
the chain such that there are, you know, there's more visible minority representation on those boards just now, just as there now is, yes. more, there are now more women. Now that we've set up the culture and orientation in our organization that this is expected um, and that we've driven this down into our portfolio companies. And we've held, by the way, Eric, we've held our partners accountable, the TPG partnership accountable to make changes in the composition of the board. Hmm. Uh, we include that, by the way, just, just as an interesting aside, we include that in the performance reviews of our partners at the end of the year. So we're now expanding that to include other forms of diversity, including racial diversity, including okay. LGBTQ. So we are doing that and uh, we're beginning to uh, initiate sort of what is the natural next phase of that program. You've been on Wall Street for a long time. You've lived through many crises. I'd like to know about some of the lessons you've drawn from those experiences and how you're applying them right now, not just to this question of race, but we're talking about the challenges that the pandemic and the economic shutdown uh, have posed, not just to the country, but on a much smaller level, you know, to the work that you're doing uh, at TPG. Parts of the economy are getting shut down. Revenue has is, is, is ceased in a number of our businesses. Other businesses are benefiting. So what do you do? So we're, we, you, you create some structure. You create some structure to the response. So on one hand, one part of the structure is evaluating our current portfolio. Where do we have issues? Where do we not? What are the issues and break them down? So things like liquidity, how long can companies play through? How are they dealing with the revolvers? So on one hand is I would call that sort of the, the, the first response of defense. How do you defend your portfolio? How do you defend your, how do you, how do you, how do you defend your investments? The other part of the structure is offensive. Okay, what are you gonna do to lean in? If, the, if this environment creates an investing opportunity, what do you do to lean in, right? How do you think about that? What are the things you wanna look at first? What is the slightly intermediate to longer term so, opportunities in terms of themes? Let's, let's get into some of those if we can. Um, some of TPG's investments have considerable exposure to COVID-19. Uh, Cirque du Soleil comes to mind. So does Viking Cruises, Airbnb, for example. Mm -hmm. you know, tell me about how you have blocked and tackled, if you will. You know, what kinds of steps have you had to take? Have you had to draw down revolvers? Have you had to use LP capital to see these companies through to the other side? And you have, to, have you had to give up on any business models because you look into the future and you decide for yourself, it just aren't going to work anymore. So clearly, you know, we've had something happen here that we've never had happen before. I mean, in literally in certain cases, revenue has stopped inside of mm -hmm. these companies, right? So the first thing that you're looking at is what are the near-term implications of that? And that generally revolves around liquidity, okay? Like how much liquidity does a company have and what are the near-term measures to improve liquidity? So that, so as you know, that included furloughs, that included layoffs in certain situations. It included various forms of kind of shutting down the engines, if you will. In order, so in order to extend the runway of these companies. Those, those are tough decisions. Yeah, they are. I mean, they're very tough decisions because they involve people um, and, um, and management teams are very loyal to their employees and as are we. Um, and so those are tough decisions. So, but the health of the company in the long run is obviously critical, right? Because those businesses employ people, those businesses obviously have value within our portfolio and on behalf of our investors. So our, our priority and our focus has to be um, the survival of these businesses and the survival of these companies. So we have drawn down some revolvers in certain cases um, as, a, as a first step. Um, uh, a second step is what I mentioned before, which is how do you reduce the burn? Okay, yep. so we've taken a number of, 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 uh, of, uh, of actions there. The third step is, is there more liquidity that we may have to provide into as investors? Do we have to provide additional liquidity to bridge the gap, if you will? And so we've, we've, we have done that in a couple of situations so far, and we may continue to do that. Um, as you say, I think at some point you do have to evaluate whether or not, you know, will something survive period, because there may be more fundamental changes on the other side of this, right? Are you and there yet? I, I'm sorry, go ahead, yeah. Oh, no, are you there yet on that question? I mean, are we far enough along into this that you are having to make those really you know, difficult? I think, you know, I, think, I think by and large, the answer is no, that we're not mm -hmm. far enough long. In other words, I mean, 
like take the cruise business as an example, right? Uh, Viking Cruise Lines is a very important business of ours. Take the cruise business. I mean, you're, you're in as good a position to evaluate that as I am, okay? I mean, you know, will people go back to cruising? Um, the answer to that is probably yes, they will. The question is when. Um, Viking Cruise Lines has two businesses. One is riverboat cruises. The other is ocean. Yep. Will people will people approach river cruises differently than they than, than they than they well, approach ocean? You know, you, you make a good point. To a certain degree, I'm in as good a position to to make that judgment or to make that call as you. But you're much closer to it. Tell me what you think. You know, what position Viking Cruises is going to be in. 12 months from now, 18 months from now, 24 months from now, it probably can't be the company it was in February. It's going to be a different company, right? It, it may, it, I think it's going to be a different company in the sense that obviously they're going to have to do things that are going to adjust the model to make people feel more comfortable, particularly at earlier stages of the return. So mm -hmm. things like passenger density, things like, you know, protective me mechanisms that have taken place, things like um, different sanit sanitization techniques, all those kinds of things obviously have to be part of it. But my view of it is that we're, we're going through an adjustment in people's mindset. Clearly, people are not going to go back to cruising the same way they were before in, um, in November, December. OK, now sometime in 2021, I, I don't know. I think, you know, it, 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 it depends on what happens with respect to things like um, treatments for, for the virus. It depends on whether or not there's ultimately a vaccine. Do I believe ultimately let me just the final question on this is. Do I believe ultimately people will go back to cruising? I do, okay? okay. Because there are a lot of very loyal um, and people that really love to do that and love to spend their vacation dollars that way. And I think ultimately the market will come back to it, but I don't know exactly when. Let me ask you this question. There are a number of different sources of capital you can draw on. There are revolvers. You can go to the banks, you can go to your LPs, you can go to the government number of private equity firms, including TPG, have participated in government aid programs. And as you know, that's a controversial issue. Tell me how you rationalized it. How did you make those decisions? When you say which, which decisions specifically are you referring to? That? The well, for example, there are opportunities and a number of private equity firms have availed themselves of these opportunities to go to the government, Health okay. and Human Services, for example. Yeah to get loans for healthcare companies. Yeah. TPG yeah. is a big player in healthcare. Right. And that's a complicated decision, not because you don't want to support your companies, but because it's controversial. Yeah. And I want to know how you, I want to know the decision-making process, a little bit, a window into it, because it's important. We've been working with all of our portfolio companies. We made a fundamental decision, very simple. Any company where we have a controlling stake at TPG, okay, would not pursue the PPP loans. Um, why did we make that decision? Very simply, as it evolved, we felt it was very unclear, really, whether or not private equity controlled companies qualified, simply put. So we determined that private equity uh, companies generally didn't qualify. Okay, there, there might be a few exceptions depending upon the interpretation. So we actually did not pursue those loans. Any companies that had taken a loan earlier on in the process, we returned the money. There are, there, are, there are some companies, just to be complete about it, where we're not majority control, where we're a minority investor. Um, and, in, and in most of those cases, we've spent time talking to the management teams. Um, and in most of those cases, those companies also have decided not to pursue it. So, um, but to be very specific and clear, in any case where we're in a control position, we mm -hmm. did not pursue PPP loans, okay? Um, with respect to um, uh, the, um, uh, the healthcare uh, companies, um, there's a slightly different situation there. What we did, a couple of our companies did participate in is what we call the advanced payment program. We had a number of healthcare companies that are providing vital essential services, okay, to um, the constituents that they serve uh, and were impacted by um, the, the situation with COVID. Um, and these are um, the advanced payment program basically is effectively advancing dollars to these companies, Eric, that they would have gotten from government sources anyway, okay? But it's just an advance of these payments. So in a number of those cases, our companies um, did in fact take advantage of those, um, uh, of those uh, uh, advanced payment uh, programs 
um, because effectively they're, they're effectively being loaned that money in advance that they otherwise would get. And it allows them to stay in business and continue providing the services that are critical and important services. So that's how we've approached the various sources of, 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 uh, of payments that are available or sources of capital that are available from the government. I don't want to dwell on the issue, but the reason I bring it up at all is because to your point, there is confusion, misunderstanding, misinformation. The, you know, the, the fundamental question comes down to this, and this is perhaps where the misunderstanding lies. People look, I say people, lots of people, broadly speaking, look at private equity as an industry. They think they, they you know, it's, 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 it's a well-off industry, let's put it that way. They yeah. say it's rich. Why does it need taxpayer support? And the answer to that is not an easy answer, but it's one that you can help them appreciate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, I think, um, it, you know, the private equity industry is definitely a well-off industry and, um, uh, and it's a, um, and, and it's done well, particularly, um, you know, if you look at what's happened over the last decade, I mean, the private equity industry has had a, a, a huge win to its back. Um, you know, uh, just allocation of capital in the market to, toward private companies. Um, I think it's worthwhile just kind of level setting and, and, and mentioning that, um, that uh, there are many more private companies in the world and, and, and in the United States than there are public companies um, and private equity. And let me just, let me just kind of draw a slightly larger circle around it and say venture capital, private equity, um, uh, private real estate capital, mm -hmm. um, you know, the broader circle around it um, has been the key uh, vehicle for capital formation for um, many, many companies that are now um, extraordinarily successful that have been the linchpin to creating um, most of the technology revolution that we're now, you know, that we're living, that, that, that's part of our daily lives today including, you know, Zoom that we're on now. Um, and number three, employing millions and millions of people in this country. So I do think that there is a disconnect and there is a lack of understanding about sort of what, what, what role and what purpose and what function private equity or venture capital or however you want to draw the circle does provide. And remember, on the other side of it, our investors um, are um, not exclusively, but um, you know, a substantial amount of the money that's coming into these funds um, that is either ben that's benefiting from investment performance or public pension funds where we're investing on the be on behalf of firefighters, policemen, mm -hmm. all these first responders, obviously, that are obviously in the midst of a pretty difficult time right now. Teachers. School, te school teachers, right? Sure. Um, um, so... I, I, I do think that it's, 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 it, it is very easy to look at private equity in terms of fees and, um, and what's the economics of the business, which has been very, I mean, the economics has been very good um, uh, for the principles that are involved in it, but it does play a very, very important role in the capital formation process and the development of private companies. Your clients are counting on you to make profitable investments. They counted on you in the past, they're counting on you now. The thinking in finance is that investors expert in distress are going to thrive in this environment. What about an investor like TPG that focuses on growth? What kinds of opportunities look most attractive to you now? Um, well, looking at uh, some, some of them, I would say are continuations of themes, even despite, you know, the pandemic and, um, mm -hmm. and, the, and the dislocation that we're experiencing in society right now, some of them are um, being amplified by it. Um, so one example, uh, certainly healthcare. I mean, TBG has an enormous footprint in healthcare. Um, you know, we have, um, we've allocated a fair amount of capital, including through this pandemic. Um, so we continue to believe that there are very important opportunities in healthcare and the pandemic amplifies some of them. Um, so, um, that's clearly a focus area of ours. Um, examples of that might be telemedicine, telehealth examples of that are the development of, um, uh, of, uh, new medications, new medicines, companies of ours, like, um, you know, Allergene, which is a cancer drug company. Um, so that's one category. A second category would be education. What's happening in education? 
Um, we have a strong focus as a firm, particularly by the way, through our impact business and our rise fund. We have a very strong focus on education, but it, but it transcends just, it, it's not only in the rise fund. We do a lot of growth equity uh, business on, the, on in education. Um, uh, we do a lot of educational related stuff in other parts of the world and Asia as an example. Um, so given, given the dislocation in terms of pe people's ability to go to school, physically show up, that's another example. I was on the so phone before I did this call on a deal that actually is an education related deal. That, that brings up an important question though, John, which is um, some of what you're describing uh, points to a future, you know, that we might call a new normal, a future shaped by the moment we're in right now. Do the changes in tastes, human behavior, you know, spending patterns, for example, tell you that we're going to be living in a different world? Um, to an extent, yes, to an extent, I think. Um, and, and I think each, you know, as we go through, you know, society kind of evolves as we go through different crises, um, you know, each of these things does in fact shape how we think about things. It shapes what our expectations are, or what we want um, as individuals. Um, uh, it, sh it shapes how we feel about being safe or not safe in terms of what we do. So it absolutely does. We're a very, I think you know this about us, but we're a very theme oriented investment firm. Okay. What we do is we have, we, we're structured by sector. We think about themes. We think about where do we want to deploy capital? We're spending a lot of time thinking about the environment that we're living through right now. And what is it going to feel like on the other side? I mean, look at the, you know, one example obviously is um, is broadband and the use of uh, you know the use of this type of connectivity. How does that affect and shape what we what we think about doing? Um, uh, you know um, it you know it tr it transcends medicine and how medicine is going to be delivered. We made an investment in a company that's a mental health providing uh, mm -hmm. provider. Um, the shock that people are going through obviously is very significant. Mental health is typically very expensive hard to access for people generally, um, but it's absolutely necessary. And there's probably more need for it today than ever before. So this it, clearly what we're going through is gonna shape how we think about some of these themes. What about the other side of it? So many of the mass market trends that TPG was capitalizing on were fueled by prosperity. Ex experiences, food fads, fitness, you mentioned social impact, it's an important thing, but it's hard to drive social impact when you're you know, when, when, when times are tougher, do, do those fizzle or fizzle out? I don't, I, well, I, I think that um, the models may have to change a little bit. Um, do I think they'll fizzle? I think um, some of them, no. I think, um, I think it's, it's just, it just changes. It just changes. Yeah. I mean, in, um, I mean, you know, take, I presume some of them become slightly less attractive as a result of the changing conditions. Yeah, presumably, I think, you know, things that may rely on, you know, sort of, you know, uh, more physical contact or, you mm -hmm. know, people crowded into one place, maybe that experience changes. Ultimately, I think, um, uh, you know, I, I, I guess what I would say is that, um, Again, recency. This is this is an interesting thing that I've learned over the years. Recency and sentiment are enormously powerful forces. Okay, both of those things are enormously powerful forces. So today, when we sit here today and we look at what's been happening and the sentiment around that, many some people say, "Well, I'm never going back to a gym or a health club," right? But we recently, where some of the states have opened back up, people are going to gyms. People are going to gyms. Okay. It's Lifetime true. fitness has had, you know, I can't remember the exact number. I should know the exact number, but I think in Texas, they opened a couple of their gyms or whatever, and they were like back to 80%. Okay. So that, like, and, and by the way, there was a, when one of the lifetimes that opened, there was literally, I kid you not, there was a line, a queue of people who were coming in to basically. So I, I, I guess the lesson is be careful about how many assumptions you make. Correct. Um, yeah. based on your recent experience because yeah. time may change that. John, the tension level between the United States and China continues to rise. The idea of a new Cold War doesn't seem so far-fetched any longer. Are yeah. you reevaluating your China strategy? Yeah, well, I think, um, uh, I, I, I think you have to. 
uh, be thoughtful about what's going on between the U.S. and China. I mean, it affects a lot of a lot of things. I mean, these you know you have these two massive economic superpowers, and there's so many things that are intertwined. Ultimately, um, I mean, just as an example, we, I was I was on a, a board call the other day, and we were talking about supply chain, and part of it we get from China, and important parts of it we get from China. So mm-hmm. as a result of that, you 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 just have to be thoughtful about that. Um, you know, I, I would say also. I, I'm going to push you though, because yep. you know people might misinterpret what thoughtful means. Does thoughtful mean change? Um, I think thoughtful means that you have to make certain changes because you have to. I think in the current environment, given the 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 um, the elevated level of risk, you have to make certain changes to lessen your dependency. I think if you don't, you do you potentially you know you do it at your own peril. So I think that. Um, we, we would be advocating for our companies to think about lessening their dependence. That doesn't mean cut it off, okay? But that means, that means risk manage. That means risk manage. That makes sense. Now, we don't know where this is going, but it's possible, right, that the battlefield may extend from where it is right now, which is trade technology and security, I would say, broadly speaking. It might extend into finance. President Trump has effectively threatened that that it that it might he might even have threatened that it will mm-hmm. what if that happens you know you can think of all kinds of reprisals the chinese might take yep for good perhaps for good reason as, as far as they see the world do you worry that your your capital might become stranded there um yeah i do a little bit <laughs> i do i mean i i think that um you know you can you can again as you you can war game you know a bunch of different scenarios on this right in terms of like what might happen um you know when you when you you do have to i think consider what might be some of the most um uh profound changes that could occur Um, adverse outcomes and you right adverse outcomes and one of them could be that there is a um that that relationships and, and economic activity effectively freezes between the U.S. and China. Now, do I believe that will happen entirely today? I think it's a low likelihood. It's certainly a higher likelihood than it was, but I believe it's a low likelihood. So as a result of that, you do have to worry about um, level of investment, how much, how much, how much value um, is, 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 um, you have as, a, as an investment organization how much value that you have and how much value and what you're flowing to china because if it gets stranded or if it gets frozen for some reason and you can't get your money out then obviously it has significant implications so we are thinking about those things again i'm not suggesting that we think we're there but i think we are evaluating a bunch of risks that if we ended up having effectively let's let's think of it as like a blackout on our relationship with china what are those risks? And so we are evaluating those things and we are taking some actions to try to think about um, how we risk manage around that. So U.S.-China relations, that's a clear risk for TPG and for all kinds of other businesses, I should add. John, you're the co-CEO of the firm. What other risks are at the top of your list? Um, uh, I I would say um, number one would be... um, this is not necessarily in order, but at the top of my list, one would be um, the impact that um, the pandemic and the environment that we're living in has on our employees. That's that's a significant risk because um, people are stressed. People are working in a different kind of environment that they're that they that that they that they've never worked in before. Um, it works for certain types of organizations. Time is a factor as well in terms of how okay. does it affect people over time. So that would be one. A second, obviously, very importantly is um, again, time associated with economic consequences of the pandemic and how it affects our portfolio. Um, And what can we do to um, manage as best we can through that? We've already talked about that earlier when you asked me about our response. Mm -hmm. So that would be a second thing. Third is um, not missing opportunities. Um, You know, that not not missing opportunities. Uh, You know, there's there's like stages to a crisis. Stage one is sort of like, the financial implications of stages to a crisis is sort of panic. Mm-hmm. Um, and in panic, there are generally opportunities. Um, the panic part of the, of the of it generally has a relatively short half-life. Then after that, okay, you then start to look at, okay, what is going to settle in? 
with respect to the environment, with respect to its impact on these businesses. So where should we be focusing our attention? And um, how responsive do we have to be? How forward leaning do we have to be in order to make sure that we capture um, uh, uh, that, that we capture our share of really good opportunities as we go through this? So, I, so a risk factor in my mind is, are we not being responsive enough? Are we being too slow, et cetera? Um, I'll give you an example when I, when I say that I'm, you know, there's um, companies are um, very actively, uh, you know, talking to bankers and advisors. Um, one of the things that we did early on is we made sure that we were being more outwardly focused with respect to advisors and bankers so that we made sure our connectivity with those people that were helping um, uh, advise companies was closely, more closely connected than it might have been um, in a, say, a more normalized environment. So making sure that we're plugged in in the right way, okay, is a risk that I was concerned about, that we were concerned about. So we took proactive steps in order to do that. So that would be another example. Well, thinking about the future and making sure you don't miss opportunities is exactly uh, what they hired you to do. John, I want to thank you very much for spending time with Bloomberg Front Row. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Eric. Enjoyed it. Appreciate it.